poll question. Is that the next slide? Yes. All righty, so the first poll question is up on the screen. Thanks, Mimi. We want to know um, what type of organization you're representing. Um, oh, it looks like both poll questions. It looks like all the poll questions have jumped up on there, Mimi. So I'm not sure how we want to do that. Please just answer the first poll question. Okay. So everyone submitted their responses. Oh, there it is, perfect. All right, so it looks like 9% are from government agencies, 5% are from municipalities, and 86% are from nonprofits, and zero for everybody else. So now we know who's all at the table. We can go on to the next slide and go over our agenda. All right, so here's our agenda for today. We will talk about the heat, heat relief network, um, and then some updates from Valley Metro and the city of Phoenix, some regional human services transportation updates, and updates from our sub-regional mobility managers. Uh, Maricopa County was unable to present today, so we hope that they will be able to come back and do so at um, a future meeting. Uh, next slide, Mimi, which I believe is another poll question. Yes, so the next poll question is, what is the highest temperature ever recorded in Arizona? This one scared me a little bit since I just moved here two weeks ago. All righty, it says 43% of you said 122 degrees, 19% said 130 degrees, 33% said 128 degrees, and 5% said 134 degrees. And the correct answer is 134 degrees in Death Valley on July 10th in 1913. And then the next highest was 128 in Lake Havasu on June 29th. 1994. All right, we'll go to the next slide and talk about um, the heat relief network. So this is a spotlight that we're going to do, um, show the great work that some of you organizations are doing for the community. So we are very grateful to have Cleo here from MAG. She's a human services transportation planner, and she will give um, an overview of the heat relief network. Thank you so much for having me and hi, Lauren, great to meet you. Um, I'll see you in the office uh, tomorrow, but great to meet you virtually. This is my first uh, transportation ambassador program meeting as well. Um, so thank you all for having me today to talk a little bit about the Heat Relief Network. Uh, whether you are deeply familiar with this endeavor because you've been participating in it for years or you're brand new, hoping to provide some background um, to catch everyone up as well as some updates to keep everyone updated on what is happening this season. So i um, happy to speak with you all. And I see we have a pretty diverse uh, set of people here. So it's great to continue spreading the word about our regional heat relief efforts. Um, so the... Uh, to, I guess, provide a tiny bit of background at first. Um, and just to remind everyone, the Heat Relief Network is a voluntary network of partners coming together each summer to offer heat relief to those in need with a shared goal of preventing heat-related injury and death. And Mimi, we can go to the next slide. Um, so some history. 
on how the heat relief network started. Uh, this was all the way back in July of 2005. Um, MAG formed the Regional Heat Relief Network in response to a record number of heat-related deaths in the region. The then Continuum of Care Chair Greg Stanton convened stakeholders with a resolve to establish a strong regional response to the heat. Um, the network really started as this entirely crisis-oriented effort with agencies volunteering each summer to open their doors to people needing to escape from the heat. And MAG's role in the network then, as well as now, continues to be mapping out the heat relief sites, as well as helping coordinate um, raising awareness about the resources that are available. And uh, also want to add some uh, information here about the Maricopa County Department of Public Health. Um, and sorry, the logo here seems to be um, cutting some information off a little bit, potentially. But um, basically, uh, uh, public health started heat death surveillance or monitoring in 2006, uh, just a year after uh, the Heat Relief Network formally formed, and they have been working very closely with this these efforts and with MAG really since the beginning, um, and this data collection has become a national model for public health heat surveillance, so we're very lucky to have them helping us out um, and being a major partner and coordinator in this work. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, just to provide us a little bit of data um, to situate the importance of this issue. Um, these, uh, this data is from the uh, public health department as well. Um, so they, I know they were not able to present um, today, but they're always open for um, questions and inquiry about um, all the data they have. And I highly recommend heading to their website um, to look at the other heat surveillance data that they have. But essentially, we do this work because we know that heat deaths are increasing every year. Uh, we know that heat affects everyone, but that there are some populations who are disproportionately at risk. So about half of all heat-related deaths are among those experiencing homelessness. And um, through the heat uh, data that the county has collected, uh, they've been able to summarize that people experiencing homelessness are about 500 times more likely to die from a heat-related cause than to those who are sheltered. And in 2023, we had 645 heat-related deaths, and this is a 52% jump from 2022, which, uh, and those 2022 numbers were already about a 25% increase from the previous year. So we can see this exponential growth happening and the importance of our heat-related efforts. Next slide, please. And then um, here, just some additional data to show who uh, really is most at risk. So we see here that the majority or about 60% of people who die from heat are over the age of 50. This includes people who are experiencing homelessness as well as those, are those who are housed. And we know that um, those particularly uh, in manufactured homes are at an additional risk. Next slide, please. So what do things look like now? Um, so far, uh, we are about, we're three weeks into um, our heat relief season that runs May through September of every year. And we have 194 locations signed up across 55 different organizations. Uh, this year, the map shows the same four locations as last year. These are collection and donation sites, hydration stations, uh, cooling centers, and respite centers. And over the years, we've really experienced this uh, increase in partnership and work from anyone through the nonprofit space to health clinics, to faith communities, to cities and jurisdictions. Uh, there's really been an all community-wide effort to ensure that we have these services available every year for those most in need. Next slide, please. So, uh, each year, we do offer this interactive map. That is MAG's biggest role in the Heat Relief Network is to map out these heat relief sites. So uh, here, um, you can sort of see the four uh, sites displayed. And this was our 2023 map. And um, in the next slide, we'll take a look at what it looks like now. 
but this map is available every year, May 1st through September 30th, and we work very hard to update it throughout the summer to reflect the most accurate site information um, and ensure that what people are seeing on the map is as accurate as possible and that particularly groups like 211 can use the map to direct those in need to services that are open and available near them. Each year, we work pretty hard to expand the number of sites, um, as well as the hours of the sites, and really be strategic about where more sites are needed and where those extra hours are needed. Um, I know that the county this year has put in a lot of effort to uh, focus on getting sites to stay open through 7 p.m., because we know even though business hours usually end at 5 p.m., the heat does not, and those can be some really dangerous hours for our area. Next slide, please. So this is a current view of our map. Um, if you go to our website, this is what you'll see. And you can toggle for the sites that are open now. You can zoom in. You can um, click on those sites to see more details of their hours and location services. And um, if your organization or an organization you know has uh, heat relief available, you can go and check and make sure that everything is displaying correctly. Next slide, please. So some additional updates for you all. Um, as mentioned, our uh, health department is taking a more active leadership role in heat relief coordination this year, um, including hiring a heat relief site coordinator to help oversee season operations and find ways to improve heat relief efforts. Uh, we know that the Arizona Department of Health Services has also hired a state coordinator as well as appointed a chief heat officer for the state. I believe we are the only state with the chief heat officer. Uh, MAG is working really closely with the county to ensure operations keep pushing forward here. And um, uh, we are also involved in the work groups and coordination happening at the state level. So trying to stay as involved as possible and make sure that we are uh, not only sharing the best practices that we have developed here in the county, but um, you know, working to continue developing what it is that uh, we offer and do every heat season. Um, so this year, we're really hoping that um, with this increased partnership and coordination from the county to the state level, we really have this opportunity to shift from the volunteer decentralized emergency response to something that's more strategic in its infrastructure and really driven by data and MAG will continue supporting the county and the state in these efforts. Next slide, please. So some opportunities for you to take action. Uh, each year, we really, really try to focus on making sure that those who need help know where to go. Uh, this is a really simple problem that uh, just has very complex solutions that we are still working on developing. Uh, so anything you could do to help us spread the word about the resources that are available and where people can go for relief is always a huge help. 211 is a really great resource in this every year. They offer rides to sites um, as well as help people find locations near them. So anyone in need can call 211 and be directed to a heat relief site that is open near them. And you can also um, access the map online and other resources we have available on our website, as well as a QR code and some um, one pagers and promotional materials that you can share out uh, to ensure that we are getting the word out about the services we have. Uh, supplies are also always needed. So these are things like cases of water, cooling towels, reusable bottles, even things like tarps or umbrellas or socks. Uh, there, these are just some of the items that um, really run in high need every summer. And uh, if you are interested in donating items, we really recommend that you look at the map and find a donation collection site near you and call them up and ask what they are in need of and coordinate uh, drop off and pick up of those supplies. Um, and I guess uh, part of this is fact that, you know, the, the supply distribution is still a pretty decent decentralized effort. So we really do rely on people like you in the community to uh, step up and make those partnerships and have those conversations with those who are offering heat relief near you to see what they need. 
And then uh, lastly, the we know that um, it's not only the number of outdoor deaths that are increasing every year, but the number of indoor deaths as well. So one of the most important things we can do as a community is check on each other and make sure everyone is safe. Um, so making sure that um, making sure that your neighbors have operating air conditioning or that um, they are making sure that they're keeping it cool enough in their house and ensuring that everyone is aware of the various resources through APS and SRP um, for, uh, for running your air conditioning and your energy bills through the summer. Uh, because we know that I believe it is 80% um, of the indoor deaths do have AC present. It's just not functioning or turned on. So um, anything we can do to make sure we're checking on each other throughout the summer um, becomes an extremely important task. And I believe um, the next slide is the final slide. So if you are looking for more information or just want to chat more about the Heat Relief Network or how you can get involved, please feel free to reach out to me and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time as well. How many um, supply drives have already happened and or I missed the part where you said cases of water, tarps, umbrellas, and there was something else in there. Sure. So to answer the first question, um, I'm not sure how many supply drives have already taken place. Uh, I know this is something that happens really on the ground. Um, different groups do various supply drives. They don't always keep us in the loop of when those are happening or spreading the word about them. So uh, I'm assuming that, you know, individual organizations have already done some and like there are student groups who do supply drives and things like that. We don't um, have any organized heat relief network wide supply drives at this time. Um, however, that'd be a great thing to talk with Francisco at the county about who is that heat relief site coordinator. And then do you guys still partner with the city of Phoenix for these heat relief sites? So yes, um, city of Phoenix is a huge partner in the heat relief network. Um, they offer, oh, I don't have it in front of me now, but they have quite a few. I believe they are the partner with the most heat relief sites on the map um, because we know the need is so severe, specifically in central Phoenix. So um, they are, yeah, definitely partnering. Uh, we're, they're always a strong partner for the Heat Relief Network and offering their services every year. And uh, this year, actually, they are offering our first 24-7 respite center. And that is located at the Burton Bar Library in the cafe that is no longer uh, functioning as a cafe, but is now a um, they've converted the space to respite where someone can go um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to get relief from the heat. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, if you have any other questions or are interested in getting involved or um, you do run a site and you notice that your information is wrong, let us know uh, so we can get that corrected. Thanks, Cleo. That was very informative and I really appreciate all the information. I think we all do. Mimi, do you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, which I believe is another poll question? Yes. Do you or your consumers use public transit? And we're just waiting for that poll question to pop up and then we can see what everyone says. And I just got my light rail pass this morning and I'm very excited to try it out. <laughs> Your light rail passes also work for bus. That's what I was told, which I'm also excited about. I love riding the bus. 
That was one of my favorite things as mobility managers. I got bus passes for all of the public transit in our five counties that I covered. So I just got to go everywhere on the bus. It was great. Alrighty, it says 26% of us use the bus or light rail. And 9% says my agency consumers use the bus or light rail. Uh, no one said they use dial a ride or paratransit. 43% um, said my agency consumers use dial a ride or paratransit. So it's good that we're, we're using the bus systems and that people we work with are, are using it as well. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Um, and like we were just talking about, public transit's a, a great option when it's available um, and appropriate for our consumers to use. And I would like to welcome Guillermo, um, who's the program supervisor at Valley Metro, to give some transit updates. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, Valley Metro updates. So uh, we really appreciate you here. Uh, we're going to have another presenter actually present a very uh, important project that we have going on right now at Valley Metro. I know many of you are familiar with what's going on with our fair media. So here is Dane Riles to help you uh, understand a little bit more of what's going on uh, for, your con for your constituents or your residents, customers, et cetera. Uh, because this is affecting anyone who rides public transit. Uh, Dane, are you there? I am. Thank you so much, Guillermo. Great. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. As Guillermo said, my name is Dane Riles. I'm a marketing program coordinator with Valley Metro and a part of the team overseeing the transition to our new fare system. Uh, I am going to go through some of the updates of the fare system for our riders, as well as some of the transition of our fare programs that I think will be of particular interest to this audience as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right. So just to go over some of the benefits of our new fare system, and then I'll kind of cover how the new system works. Um, one of the most important things that I usually present when I talk about our transition to the new system is that our fare pricing structure is not changing. Um, so for our local full fare riders who pay $4 a day, $20 a week, or $64 in a month, that fair pricing structure will remain in place. It's really the mechanism of how you use and pay for your fare that's changing. Um, the new system that we're launching is an account-based system, which means our riders will create an account if they choose. It is it is optional, um, but that will give them options to you know access to buy and manage the fares that they use. So there's a lot more um, features available to our customers as well as access to purchase and manage their fares. The main feature in the new system is what we are calling SmartFare. Um, SmartFare is a pay-as-you-go system, and I'll cover how that works in a few slides. Um, another very exciting part of this project is that we are replacing all of our uh, aging hardware out on the system, which means our fare boxes on buses will be replaced completely, and our fare machines at light rail stations are also going to be replaced. Some of that is already underway, and all of that will happen uh, over the summer. The last thing I also want to mention is that our specialty fare programs will remain in place. That means things like our reduced fare program, our ADA platinum, platinum programs, um, and some of our more corporate or group fares programs will still be available. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those programs in a few slides. Next slide, please. So to give a little bit of an overview of the project timeline, this has been a years long project um, and we're really getting to the most critical part of the transition, which is transitioning all of our riders to the new system. Um, we did have the Valley Metro app launch in 2021. And then in 2023, we added the mobile fare option. That was just a new option for our riders in addition to all of the other past products that we offer. Um, earlier this year, we also uh, out, we also launched a, an option for applying for reduced fare online, so our riders can go online to apply for reduced fare in addition to some of our in-person locations. Um, we have, over the last few months, started to distribute um, our specialty cards, so the Platinum card, ADA Platinum, A+. Um, all of those have started to transition to the new system. 
most of those cards will transition effective June 1st. Uh, we are anticipating a soft launch of the new system in June. And when I say soft launch, what I really mean is that, um, as you might guess, this is not going to happen overnight. Um, so we will have some of our sales channels start to roll out in June, uh, making cards available to people, updating the app, um, and really, you know, again, ensuring that we give people time to transition to the new system. So we're not doing a quick, uh, you know, transition or an overnight transition. We want to make sure we give all of our customers the time they need to make that change. Um, once all of those channels are online, we will consider the system fully launched this summer. Um, and then we will be eliminating the paper passes. Uh, right now, the end date for those passes is looking like July 31st. However, as I mentioned, we want to make sure we give people plenty of time to transition. So that may be adjusted a little bit just to make sure people have time for the transition. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that we will have a process in place to get credit for any passes that were not used. So if someone bought some day passes and they didn't use them before the transition, we will offer credit for those older passes into the new system. Next slide, please. On the next, next few slides, I'm going to cover a little bit about how SmartFare and the new system will work. Um, SmartFare, as I mentioned, is a pay-as-you-go model, which gives you access to the daily, weekly, and monthly fares without having to pay up front for your pass. The way that it, it will work is that our writers primarily will choose between two options. Um, the copper card, which is a physical smart card, um, similar to our paper passes today, but it's more of a plastic card um, that you would use over and over again. Um, the other option in the new system is the Valley Metro app, which is available today and will transition into more functionality in the new system. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is an account-based system, so our customers would load value to their card or their app, and they will tap their card or scan the Valley Metro app every time they ride the bus or ride the light rail. Next slide, please. So they will tap their card every time they ride. However, they will only be charged until they reach the daily, weekly, and monthly fare. On the screen, I have our fair prices listed, $4 a day, $20 a week, $64 a month. That is in line with our current fair pricing. And as I mentioned, in the new system, you will pay each time you ride until you reach those amounts. And then once you reach those amounts, you will not pay for the remainder of the rides within that period. Um, so we do think that this is not only a cost effective uh, and efficient way to charge our fares, but it's also more equitable. Um, the example I always like to give is that right now our 31 day pass is $64 and you have to pay that full cost up front in order to get that for fo um, full fare for local service. In the new system, you do not have to have $64 up front. You will only pay up until the daily, weekly, or monthly fare, um, and you will pay as you go. So you we're giving access to those monthly prices to a lot more people. Um, reduced fare is available in the new system. The reduced fare prices are the same as they are today. And on the next slide, I have a few other updates on reduced fare, um, and that is, next slide, please. That is the main change in the new system is that a reduced fare account will be required in order to get the daily, weekly, and monthly fare pricing. Um, we are working to ensure that our writers have access to apply for reduced fare, um, not only online, but also in person with a lot of outreach that we are doing and will continue to do throughout the launch of the system. Um, I do wanna also mention that a single ride pass for reduced fare and full fare will still be available on the buses and at light rail stations using cash on buses and our fare machines at light rail stations. So even if someone does not have a reduced fare uh, copper card or reduced fare in the app, they still have access to the reduced fare one ride pass. I also will mention um, that our reduced fare categories have not, our qualifications have not changed. Um, youth ages six to 18, seniors 65 and above, People with disabilities and Medicare cardholders are qualified today and will continue to be qualified in our new fare system to get reduced fare. Next slide. I've talked a lot about uh, the app and the card, so I'll go quickly on these slides. I just want to mention that, you know, especially in the summer months, the Valley Metro app is a, is a really great resource for people who are taking the system. In addition to paying your fare, you can also plan your trip 
You can look at the real-time location of a bus or light rail train um, and get rider alerts if there's any delays or interruptions to service. Uh, so that ensures that, again, in the summer especially, we're not, you know, no one has to stand out at the bus stop any longer than needed um, in order to get ready to take the bus or train. Next slide. As I mentioned, another option to pay in the new system is the copper card, which is a reloadable physical card. Um, the copper card will be available once the system begins to launch this summer. Um, you'll be able to purchase that online on the new fares website. Uh, we'll also have it available at hundreds of retail locations across the region, including Circle K, Albertson, Safeway, Food City, and Basha's to start, and we'll add more locations as we go. Um, we also will have new fare machines at light rail stations to purchase the card and load the card. And we'll also have them available at our transit centers with, with uh, in-person windows. Um, we will be doing a lot of outreach on the system, as I mentioned as well, as we transition into the new system. Um, so we definitely look for uh, opportunities and availability to provide copper cards to people out on the system uh, to help them with that transition into the new way to pay. Next slide. <laughs> Just as a quick overview of how the new system works, uh, the, the copper card will be tapped on the front of the purple fare reader, which is already on board all of our buses and at our light rail stations. Um, today, that purple fare reader is used for some of our specialty cards and the mobile app, but everyone will use that if they have a copper card. Uh, they'll tap the card on the front of the device. If they have the Valley Metro app, they will scan using the QR code on your app uh, by holding the phone below the device. Next slide. So I do want to quickly touch on our specialty fare programs that are transitioning um, into the new system. Um, we do have a group fares program that will be a part of our new fare system that was formerly known as the corporate program, um, but that is for organizations and businesses who are currently purchasing paper passes in bulk. Um, there's a few options of how those programs and organizations can transition in the new system. Uh, they could purchase reloadable cards to be used um, just, just like the standard copper card, um, but we will also have limited use cards that are more of a paper program product, um, and those can be used specifically by organizations who may need them for employees or clients or constitu constituents that they work with. Um, so this is a really important part of the transition is having these additional options for organizations who are distributing FAIR. Um, so I encourage anyone who may need information about these programs to email Valley Metro. Um, the email address for this program is groupfairs at valleymetro.org. Um, we are planning planning to do outreach to the organizations who have previously been purchasing paper passes. That outreach will happen over the next few months to transition organizations into the new fare system and to ensure that they have the coverage of um, passes available, regardless of if it's the old passes or new. Next slide, please. Another program that was previously uh, managed by the City of Phoenix and is now going to be managed by Valley Metro is the Social Services Fair Program. Um, this was formerly known as the Homeless Provider Program with the City of Phoenix. Um, Valley Metro will oversee this program, and that provides passes to for organizations to use um, to distribute to people experiencing homelessness. Um, those are full fare passes, and those are those paper or reloadable cards like I mentioned. Um, they're a full fare product, but they're sold at half the cost. Um, so these organizations, um, some organizations are already participating in this program. We, again, Again, we'll be transitioning all of those organizations into our new FAIR program, um, but if anyone needs information or would like to have an additional discussion about the program, you can also email Valley Metro at fairprograms at valleymetro.org. Um, and like I said, both of these programs are very important to Valley Metro, um, and over the next two to three months, we'll be making a lot of contacts to organizations to make sure that we're transitioning everyone smoothly and making sure that anyone that is using our passes has a smooth um, and seamless transition. Next slide, please. 
Uh, on our website, we have more of an information available generally about the FAIR project at valleymetro.org slash FAIR technology. I also encourage everyone to sign up for our email uh, notifications. That'll have a lot of great information as things progress over time. Um, you can sign up for our emails at valleymetro.org slash notice, and there is a specific email uh, list for this project. And again, that'll be a great way to get information as we start to roll out the new FAIR system over the coming months. I will pause there and open it up for any questions. All right, I'm not, oh, go ahead, Guillermo. I just kind of wanted to say, this is a great opportunity if you have any questions regarding fares, your organization, getting fare cards, uh, your um, customers using public transit to get to and from your facilities uh, with any questions that are going on. Dane is, is the main resource for our public outreach for this. So this is a great opportunity if you have any questions whatsoever. I think we have a question from Joy. And I think you're on mute. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is fantastic information. I do have a question for you. I work for the Arizona Coalition for Military Families, and we oftentimes, we have veterans that request assistance in our transportation program, but what they are requesting is something like the copper card. So for us, what would be the best way for us to go into the system and be able to actual, actually order the card for someone. And if we do that, do you mail it to them? How would that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so our, our FAIR programs, like the Group FAIR program and the Social Service FAIR program, will have a portal. Um, that is for organizations to use to do exactly what you're talking about. You'll be able to order cards. You'll be able to load products onto those cards. Um, and that will be a great resource for you as an organization. Um, they would be mailed to you as you order them through that portal. And then you could distribute them. Um, there, and like I mentioned, there's two different options. You can do a reloadable card, which is really intended for clients or people that you see on a frequent basis and may continue to have a need for uh, using transit. Um, and then we have the limited use cards, which are really intended for a one-time use. And maybe that's used, you know, for, for people who just have a need this week, and maybe that's not an ongoing need. Um, that just gives you more of a um, disposable paper product that's available specifically to organizations. So I do encourage you to reach out to Valley Metro. Um, we will give you more information and, and make sure you're a part of that transition. And as a part of the transition, you'll get access to the portal and, and training on how to get those products. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. And as Guillermo mentioned, we are more than happy to answer questions via email as well um, and be a resource to make sure that the transition for all of our customers is smooth. Um, definitely appreciate everyone's time. Dane, thank you for that update. It's always good to see the reloadable cards. I've seen those a couple of times at the bigger transit systems, and I think it's a really, really good idea. So I'm excited to to have that launch and to hear how how everybody is utilizing that in the next few months. All right, let's. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'll continue our our Valley Metro updates um, with the uh, the proposed service changes. Uh, next slide, please. So here, the Tempe Flash. We do we are proposing a change to that. We are modifying the current route by eliminating a portion uh, serving the Tempe Transit Center and East Apache Boulevard. The proposed route adjustment will head west on Apache Boulevard to serve Gamage Auditorium and loop around Gamage Parkway and Mill Avenue. Next slide, please. Uh, route 13, we are proposing a route extension to uh, connect uh, the 24th Street and Sky train station. Next slide, please. Another route extension um, 
They're extending uh, the route along baseline and set to 79th to service the Gila River Indian Community Service Center on 83rd and back east on baseline. So that's a very short proposed uh, service changes we have. We love to hear your feedback. Uh, we have a public hearing. Uh, it's gonna be hybrid, so it will be remote too on May 24th. You can reach us online at input at valleymetro.org for any comments. And you can complete a survey of, of our service changes um, at the website that you see there, valleymetro.org slash maps schedule slash service dash changes. You could also submit an official comment for this public hearing. You could write your comment in the chat box of uh, this webinar. Uh, and then if uh, DD or Lauren can have that sent to me, I will make sure it gets to the right location. And uh, you could also send a voicemail at 602-322-4479. And you could uh, leave a voicemail there with your comments. Uh, you could also contact us and leave uh, your comment regarding a cha proposed change with our customer service at 602-253-5000. Uh, next slide, please. Paratransit updates. So just a little bit to show you uh, where our paratransit trips are. In uh, quarter one, so far, we had 70,000 trips. Quarter two, six, almost 62. Quarter three, we had a little bit more, about 66. And quarter, quarter four through April, so we just started in April, we had 23, almost 24,000. Our on-time performance, as you can see, was in the high 70s or, or uh, mid 80s most of the quarter. We did uh, have a little slump in second quarter. Um, however, this is our first year with our new provider. So we are, uh, I guess, going through some growing pains, if, if what you mean. So that's where you can see that most of our uh, complaints revolve around service delays. Uh, and then we are constantly working to improve the system. And our goals for this fiscal year is to enhance the customer experience by improving our system's reliability. Next slide. Right choice updates. As you can see, right choice updates. Uh, the first two quarters were in the 60s. The third quarter was the first time we actually exceeded paratransit trips with our right choice program. On uh, the fourth quarter, we have already exceeded right choice trips. Um, if you remember, paratransit trips were at 23, right choice is almost at 26. Uh, we have a very low uh, complaint volume with our trips, and they primarily revolve around reservation accuracy. Uh, at times, uh, what it is is with the map system, if the map has not been updated, the system doesn't know where it is. And with our city and how it's being developed so quickly, there are addresses that have not been updated in our mapping system. And we constantly have to be updating that or actually create a ping for that specific address. So um, as these items do happen, we are correcting them as they occur. Currently, we have 12 providers with a total of 108 wheelchair accessible vehicles, and we are always working to expand those providers. And our goal is to decrease customer complaints even further with our right choice program. Next slide. Any questions or comments? All right, um, I guess that concludes my presentation. If you do have any questions, comments, or anything that you have are curious about what's going on with our Valley Metro system, you could always contact me at gonzalez at valleymetro.org, or you could reach out to uh, Didi or Lauren um, and they could uh, help you get those comments over to me. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Guillermo. I will check the chat box to see if you put any of the comments in there, um, and I'll make sure to get those over to you if they do pop up in there. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Mimi, I think we can go to the next poll question, which is, are you a Section 5310? Um, sub-recipient. All 
And I'm very interested in this question because I know those of you who are, I'll be working very, very closely with, um, and those of you who aren't, but would like more information on that. So I'm excited to see the results of this one for sure. Oh, I love that. 95% of you are already 5310 recipients. That's very exciting. All right, so we can go on to the next slide, which is updates from the City of Phoenix. Um, so I'd like to introduce Wendy, who is the Federal Grants Administrator for City of Phoenix in the Public Transit Department and our designated recipient. Um, and Wendy's going to provide um, some updates on the 5310 program. Well, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just very brief updates today. This is the time of year when our program, uh, our process from the 5310 is winding down. We're doing some housekeeping items and things of that nature. But just to give you a couple of quick updates, um, our vehicles are starting to arrive finally from our 2022 process and 23 process. We've just place the orders on those after our grant was awarded. So with all those delays that we've had in our program, it's exciting to get those things finally moving. Most of you should have gotten, um, if you were awarded out of the 2023 competitive selection process, you should have gotten a copy of your uh, grant agreement from the city of Phoenix. So we're excited to get those going. We have uh, received some requests for reimbursements finally. So if you haven't seen anything on that and you have questions, um, just send us an email at section 5310 at phoenix.gov. Um, so we're just working away on getting all those things squared away um, for the 2024 process. Um, we, I believe uh, that's still undergoing. Um, it's in the MAG uh, committee process for approval. And subrecipients should be notified of awards um, probably within the next month or so. Um, so that's moving along. And then finally, you uh, for those that are on our email list uh, and invites to our regular section 5310 uh, subrecipient optional training, you should have gotten a notice uh, today that our June 13th training uh, was canceled. Uh, there was a conflict with uh, our compliance staff who provide that training, and they will be sending out a new invite when they can get a new date scheduled. So I don't think we have any currently scheduled trainings until um, August, where we'll start off our vehicle maintenance training and going back into our annual NPR training after that. So. I said it was brief, I kept it brief, but I will open it up to any questions that anybody has. When do you said the next training is in August? Any other questions for Wendy? Nope, alrighty, we can move on to the next poll question. Does your agency have a formal speeding policy? All right, 44% of you said yes, 39% said no, and 17% said not sure. I have a question regarding that question, Lauren. Yes, I may or may not know the answer. When you say formal speeding policy, 
Do you mean the process if someone is caught speeding or that they're supposed to AZ law to, to not go over the speed limit? That was a little confused on the question. That I'm not sure. Um, I, I would just... chime in on that one. Okay, thanks, I can, Billy. I can help too. It's Wendy. Perfect. Um, Someone will have the answer. <laughs> ultimately, it's trying to decipher whether or not your drivers, your your organizations that are having uh, your your employees driving, if you have a formal speeding policy in place, right, Billy? Isn't that what we're getting at? Yeah, that's true, Wendy. And I think in uh, to kind of drill down a little further on that, I think some of the discussions we had were, you know, looking at a formal speeding policy saying, if you are X number of miles per hour over a certain speed limit, this is the consequence that you'll have. And, you know, like kind of really specifying, um, you know, what will happen if a person is speeding and what what consequences there would be as well. So um, a lot of policies I know will just say obey traffic laws and then kind of go into detail about that. Whereas having a speeding policy is more along the lines of these are the cutoffs and the consequences based on how far over the speed limit and also for how long too. So if a, if a, a, a monitoring device in a vehicle shows that you were speeding five miles an hour over, for 10 seconds, it might be because you needed to pass somebody, whereas if it's a sustained speed also. So, you know, looking at those kind of details. Thank you, Billy and Wendy. That was very, uh, a very vague question. So I'm glad that you both had had good detailed answers for that. Okay. Um, I'm interested to see and find out who has them, how they're implemented, things like that. And I know that's something that um, we're starting to look into. So that's why we asked um, that question today. All right, maybe we can go into the next slide. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna provide some updates um, that Didi sent over to me. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, so we're happy to report that the Opportunity Tree was recently on the news for a very, very good reason. Um, they were recently featured on Good Morning Arizona um, for their basketball team. So would anyone from the Opportunity Tree like to give us some more information about that and tell us how that experience was? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Neil here. Good to meet the usual suspect and good to see the usual suspect. Pleasure to meet everybody else. Um, welcome to your new position too, Lauren. Yes, we're the Opportunity Tree. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we're going to pull up a little presentation here in a moment, but specifically to what you're looking at, um, we're, you know, like everyone else, we're busy making waves in the community and making a splash and, and just out there. And so we met uh, Miss Simone C with Arizona Family Channel 3 at a Special Olympics event. And we'll touch on our Special O programs in just a minute. Uh, and just said, hey, you need to come to the Opportunity Tree, check us out for a tour. And so that turned into a live spot on a Friday morning, May 3rd, live with the Fire Slammer Nation, the Phoenix campus. Um, and it was a very, very cool experience. And so, yeah, we're, we're grateful for that. Funny enough, what led us here, we are uh, 5310 participants and we're, you know, very connected with the MAG community, et cetera. Didi, of course, our great leader, saw that live on the news and picked up that in the background, hey, that's a bunch of MAG buses and Starcrafts and intervents and stuff. So reached out to us and said, we want to put this on and highlight at the MAG meeting. So what you're looking at is sure enough, some 2019, 2020 Dodge intervents. Um, some of the Chevy Expresses, we're all familiar with those, the 12 passengers. And then, of course, our Ford Starcrafts uh, 2019 through 2023. There are a couple of those models there. So, of course, that caught Mag's eye, DD. And here we are. So we're going to touch on that in just a minute as well. Um, so, yeah, if we could do slide uh, time check. I promise we won't take too, too much time. But we have, what, about five, ten minutes? Lauren, is that right? I believe so, yes. Okay, cool. 
So big picture, we are the Opportunity Tree. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we support folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities uh, who are con or who have and are recipients of DDD services, the Division of Developmental Disabilities, which is underneath the uh, DES umbrella, Department of Economic Security. And so um, folks in our programs due to um, their disability are able to come to one of our four campuses and or live in our homes, all provided and funded through the DDD uh, network. So we have four campuses, uh, Phoenix, Maricopa, Avondale, and Casa Grande, uh, 20 community integrated living homes as well, 15 here in the Phoenix area, five in CG and Casa Grande. Funny enough, our biggest presence is in Phoenix, uh, as far as the MAG region goes, it's actually our only presence in the MAG region. The other three communities fall into the ADOT region. So we do what we're doing here in very similar fashion with the ADOT and the CAG people, Central Arizona Association of Government. So we're kind of a foot in both counties. Uh, Phoenix, our Phoenix campus is our home. This is our 60th year of service. We started in 1963. If you've been to our Phoenix campus on 32nd Street in Thomas, uh, this was given to the agency back in the 1950s as the Perry Institute for Brain Damaged Children, which, of course, in that time, that was regular nomenclature, um, and still serves the same purpose that it did back then today, namely helping folks with uh, different ability levels achieve the highest quality of life possible to us all. Um, so with no further ado, hit it, please. Mission statement. You can find that on our website, chalked on all of our uh, programs and flyers and every piece of collateral you could ever find. The key word in our mission statement is dynamic and innovative environments. So of course our campuses, our homes, that makes a lot of sense there, the physical presence, but that also um, transfers to our staff, our members, our programs, our energy, where we're at in any given time, what we're doing. And then also weirdly enough, but makes sense for our crew here translates to our vehicles. So what does our ride experience look like? What does pick up and drop off look like? What's our drivers uh, interactions with our members and our passengers look like? What does going out into the community on a Tuesday afternoon to go interview for a job or to go to a special Olympic tournament or to integrate in the community? What does that experience look like and feel like on our buses, on our transits, um, on our vans, 12 passengers, accessible passengers, you know, all the rest. So, we take that statement very literally across all of our uh, environments. And then our vision is to promote the development of society that fully embraces us all, individuals with disabilities, without inclusion, advocacy, opportunity. So that's the big 30,000 foot view of what goes on at the Opportunity Tree. Next, please. Go ahead, Chief. Kelly, our CEO is on here Hi. too. Tag team. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for having us today. Um, so, yeah, we've been in Arizona since 1963. We have about 250 members across Arizona. Over 70 of our members we've served for over 30 years or more. So when we were a school, some of these individuals came to this school and they're still in our programs today. As Neil mentioned, we have four communities across two counties. Um, we have four campuses and 20 community integrated residential settings. And I will add what Neil um, didn't add. Yes, we're part of the 5310 MAG program, but seven years ago, we weren't. Um, so when I started here seven years ago, we were very successful and we we're very grateful for all our MAG vehicles. So if you guys are on here and you haven't applied, I would suggest you apply. Um, our fleets, oh, well, it will go into the details, but we have about 62 vehicles in our fleet now. Um, so our agency is an employment first agency. Um, we believe that employment should be offered a first option for anyone so that they work in the in the competitive integrative employment in the community. We shuttered our um, sheltered workshop at the end of September last year. So we no longer do peace rate. We're all out in the community with jobs and employers. Uh, we have 75 athletes in our special Olympic sports this year. Uh, actually, I thought it was 90 though. But anyway, um, we we connect with over a thousand people annually for programs and services. We have Day at the Tree Fort programs. We partner with the local high schools and all our communities and bring the kids out for a fun day, introduce them to our programs. Um, we we serve people of all ages, right, from 14 up until 85. Um, so we have a wide breadth of people that we um, support here at the Opportunity Tree. Um, our biggest program, the one that I'm most excited about, is a supported aging program for our seniors um, here in Casa Grande. We partnered, and I think there's a slide about this, we partnered with Hospice of the Valley um, about two years ago because we realized that some of our older members 
um, were aging and getting dementia. And a fact in our community is that if you have Down syndrome, you are 98% guaranteed to have dementia later on in life. And so we felt that this was really important um, to create a quality of life for these individuals. There's no other program um, like it in the country. There's I misspoke. There is one in Florida, which I'll be going down next month to view. But the hope of partnering with Hospice of the Valley is that we can come up with a program and duplicate it across you know, states and programs. And I'll let Neil take it over because he loves to talk about our programs. So we have four core programs uh, similar to our sister agencies out there. Mr. Parker, we see you, sir. Uh, our Seeds Employment Services gets our folks out working in the community. You want to get a job? Starts from exploring our interests, career goals, ambitions, what we want to do with the rest of our lives. Uh, goes into finding resources. Where do we go apply to these types of jobs that I'm interested in as an individual? Sitting with our Seeds Employment Services staff crafting a plan to go get the job, go interview for the job. Hopefully you get the job, then our people are on site with you at the job um, and transitioning into full community integrated employment. Whether that's five hours a week to start, whether that's a full 40, whether that's anything in between, uh, we are just happy to help our folks who are ready to go, ready to work, do it out in the community. So those uh, services are funded through Voc Rehab and DDD as well. Um, the counterpart to that is our LEAF Adult Day Program. That is all about quality of life, community integration, independent skill development, Special Olympics is a big component of that, volunteerism in the community, helping our folks understand that we can also be a part of the solution, whatever solution X is for problem X, we can also be proactive members in our community that way. Um, and again, overarchingly, all this goes on at our all four of our campuses all year round. Our Tree Ford Youth Program, Kelly spoke, touched on that a little bit. Uh, we are heavy, heavy in uh, partnership and in relationships with our school base. As we, as most of us probably on the call know, or if you don't, for our folks, especially um, teens, young people with intellectual disabilities, high school is a different kind of experience. That is kind of the hub in life where our folks are safe. There's a lot of structure there. School psychologists are present. Teachers are there. Resources are there. The bus is coming. The bus is dropping off. You know, all those things that when high school ends, for many neurotypical people, cool, next day to life, college, or get a job, or whatever that is. For our guys, a lot of times it's like, holy cow, what the heck is going to happen now? All those structured supports and inherent things that kept the guide rails on our experience in life here are all of a sudden gone. Teacher's gone. We're not going to school anymore. Psychologist stops calling. No more meetings. So we make it very or we are very intentional about getting schools onto our campuses inviting ess formerly known as special ed classes onto our campuses for day at the tree for tours to learn about not only the youth after school program which is developed designed for our teens to come after school come during the summer come on school breaks to start getting acclimated to the opportunity tree and to learn about us and we learn about our you know youth members get to know staff get the whole vibe of whatever campus um, houses, you know, the services for you. And then, so when you do graduate as a person and or you're a parent, you say, holy cow, Miss so-and-so, my teacher that I've known for seven years and that I love and trust so much, what should I do with my son or daughter when they leave your classroom? So teachers know about us, parents know about us, members, students know about us. And our goal is to have people leave our campuses and leave those experiences with, holy cow, what's the next phase of my life? The opportunity tree, hopefully. Um, so that's a big push for us. And then, of course, the youth program itself is action packed, high octane schools for suckers, throw the backpacks in the corner and, you know, get on with a youth program, teen program, while also slowly, um, intentionally and informally building what do you want to do with the rest of your life? What kind of jobs do you want to do? What are you good at? What are your interests? Start working on those skills. So by the time graduation comes, our folks either jump right into seeds employment or perhaps start in our leave programs or do some sort of hybrid of both. Um, so that's where the tree for youth program comes in. And then on the later aspect of life, when it's time to start thinking about where am I going to live? Do I live at home? Are my loved ones aging? What's the next step when they move on or pass on or situations change? Well, our community living program is just that it's home. And so as Kelly mentioned, the full life cycle is a powerful thing because you walk onto any one of our campuses and we got young gunners coming off the bus, 14, 15, we got LEAF and SEEDS members going to get jobs, doing Special Olympics, doing all sorts of adult stuff in the community. And then we've got our Golden Age supported agent folks that are truly like, 
the historical embodiment of the opportunity tree and disability rights in Arizona, all living on the same campus at different stages with services and programs available for all. Um, and then we'll touch on special O and support agent in a minute. Next, please. This one will be rapid fire. There's our four locations. Next, please. Uh, next, please. C's program, in a nutshell, we talked about it, VR, DDD, helping you get the job, helping you keep the job, retain the job, and work until you're ready to retire. Next, please. Three Ford Youth Program, we touched on the importance of that, the tip of the spear, so to speak, for our folks 14 and up, connecting them with our services and programs early. So by the time that transition comes, it's not a big shock to the whole ecosystem of the family. Holy cow, what's next? Didn't even think about it. We're looking down the face of a cliff. You know, what are we going to do? The tree fort sets our youth up to already in the pipeline, for lack of a better word, connection already with what's available to them after graduation. Next, please. Leave program. We touched about that. Oh, and big. I'm sure we've all figured it out by now, but all of these services are free for folks with DDD. Um, DDD services allows for the programs, the community living homes, all the things we do on campus during the day, during the programs, free of charge. Transportation, we're going to touch on too, but the DDD system pays for essential transportation for our members to and from home, most notably. Next, please. Community living, 20 homes. In addition to our 20 group homes, which are 24-7, fully staffed, vehicle allocated to each home, um, we have IDLA programs, which is independent uh, living arrangement. And in a nutshell, our folks who are living on their own in their own um, funded spaces, whether they're renting an apartment or paying a mortgage, whatever it is, can contract IDLA services with us and we send staff in at a prearranged schedule to make sure things are functioning and the guys are shaving and no one's burning down the house and all that kind of thing. Um, as well as our in-home services, respite, attending care, habilitation for folks living in their own homes that we can come in and provide services for the family that way. Next, please. Supported aging, Kelly touched on that. Our Hospice of the Valley partnership is huge for us. Uh, and it's a true pioneering program for all the reasons Kelly mentioned earlier. Um, and we're continuing to grow it. This is offered in Phoenix. It's also offered in Casa Grande as well. So we're gonna continue to grow this um, as much as we can. And it's an important piece that's new to our shared community because our guys are living longer. And that's just what it is. So we all gotta figure it out as we go. Next, please. Oh, and it's just a side note, but this is our mighty, mighty fire slam of nation. So you'll hear a lot about Special Olympics. And if you've seen it on TV or you've heard about it, or perhaps you volunteered at an event or you've been somewhere where there's Special Olympics, it's a ton of high fives, big smiles, hugs, gold medals, all the rest. But really what's most transformational about it that we see all the time is Special Olympics is its own 501c3, its own nonprofit, its own network, and it's, it touches every state touches multiple countries, it's worldwide. And so for our population specifically, Special Olympics is something bigger than any of us as agencies, as families, as members. And it's truly an existential experience that our people can plug into, which to be quite frank is rare for our guys to be a part of something bigger than themselves. So you go to the state tournament, basketball, boxy, track, whatever it is, and you see our members connecting with, holy cow, there was my teacher in high school I haven't seen 10 years. Holy cow, I used to go to that agency with you. Where are you at now? I'm at the tree now. We're fire slammers now. You know, you get all these social connections that are only possible because we're all together at Special Olympics. And then for, you know, upper echelon athletes, people with actually like athletic predispositions and physical skills, there is that are prone to like sports. There's an entry point into like national games and world games, which just gives a whole other channel of experiences to our members. And then for our folks who are slower movers or perhaps in our supported aging program or who don't have the physical skills to, you know, go 100% on the court, there's individual skills competitions, there's um, individual sports. So there's truly arenas of competition for all ability levels, all skill levels, all mobilities, all the rest that really is an all-encompassing, fully inclusive experience using sport as a vehicle for social inclusion. So when you see a, when you see a post or you get an email about, your hometown fire slammers come and do a competition near you. Come check us out. That little picture is just a snapshot of the pandemonium that awaits. Okay, next, please. So this is what we're here for. There's our fleet. This first slide is our fleet in total. And the second slide, which we'll get to in a sec, is our 5310 fleet. And you'll see very, very quickly that we couldn't do all this. Everything we talked about, the reason Channel 3 came out, all, we couldn't do out any of this without the 5310 program. As we all know on this call, 
transportation is the lifeblood of everything we do, especially in these huge, crazy metro areas. And so without the Starcraft and without the passenger vans and without the inner vans and without the accessibility, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. All this would just be dreams. Like, wow, it'd be really cool if, but we can't because we can't take our people anywhere. So you'll see in a minute what that all means. But servicing four campuses and 20 homes, 61 vehicles total, 35 in the MAG region, 26 in the ADOG CAG region. That's just total. That's not 5310 vehicles. That's all of our vehicles. 28 accessible. We can agency-wide transport up to 523 people. We can then transport up to 83 passengers with accessible needs. That's just a scope. And, and these seats, for all intents and purposes, are generally filled at some point throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month. So we're transporting and using the vehicles a lot. And again, they're the lifeblood of what we do when we couldn't do any of this stuff without the constant back and forth that our vehicles afford us. So next, please. Keeping that in mind, there's the impact of the program. So out of 61 vehicles, 25 of them, a little shy of half, are all 5310 vehicles. So yeah, that's only half of the fleet. However, it accounts for all of our Starcrafts, all of our passenger vans, and about 98% of our accessible vehicles. Um, and again, between ADOT and the MAG regions really makes the whole thing go. So 25 out of 61, okay, but out of 28 accessible vehicles agency-wide, 21 of them are 5310, and 14 of those 21 are right here in Phoenix in the MAG region. And when I say Phoenix, I mean our Phoenix campus, but also we have, we've got a couple of our um, intervans sprinkled throughout our homes. So our community integrated homes, are also in Phoenix that we have um, residents and members there with accessible needs. We have some of those vehicles deployed out to the homes as well. So out of the 523, our 5310 passenger capacity is 262. So, I mean, it's a little, it's right there at half essentially. So you take all that out of the mix and we're left with dusty old Dodge Caravans from 2015 with like one wheelchair lift that was retrofitted at some stage of the game that who knows where it came from before any of us showed up. So just a snapshot again. Thank you to 5310, Wendy, Dee, the whole crew. Man, everybody on this call knows we can do it without y'all. So we really appreciate that. And you are what makes this go. Next slide, please. That's all we got. Oh, quick snapshot. Then we'll end, I promise. 60 years in the game. These are pictures from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Picture 32nd Street and Thomas. That first picture on your top left is when they were building it, the 1950s with the dude in the pants and the big camera smoking the cigarette with the little red tie. That was Phoenix in 1955 before this building was built. Those are some of our homes. There's our CG site from 1970. Clearly the young lady in the middle bottom was job skills back in the day, learning computers, et cetera. And then one more slide. 60 years later, this is now. We're doing the same thing. That same picture in the top left is our Phoenix campus with a great big Chrysler right in front. Um, and our members now, Special O, Supported Aging, youth members, community, the whole thing. Thank you for listening. Come check out the Fire Slammer competition near you. And that's a whole subsection, but we can stop that though. Thank you, Neil. That was really, really cool. I mean, we can go through this. I think we've got time. We're so down. Kelly will shoot me, but let's do it. Okay, right back to the top. This will take literally three minutes. This is a snapshot, and this is kind of what we did. Oh, you but... don't know what you did, Lauren. Yes, thank you, Lauren. This is great. So, this is our man, Raleigh. This is just a snapshot of, like, the whole thing and 60 years and the power and all this. But Raleigh is one of our supported aging members. He is now in his mid to late 50s. We won't reveal his exact age for HIPAA, even though you see his picture and know his first name. But Raleigh's story is unique. And, well, not unique in, like, it's just him, but he does encapsulate a subset of our members that we touched on at the beginning. So if you go one more slide, please. This is when Raleigh came to what was known as the Arizona Foundation for the Handicapped, which is now the Opportunity Tree. 1978, we pulled his paper, his original intake folder on a dog-eared, dusty, yellow, Fallen apart document that said Raleigh, 1978. That's when he showed up to the, the tree. Raleigh lived in the institution previous. His parents were from a different part of the country. And he ended up in an institution in Arizona. His parents still in the other part of the country. And then came to AFH again back in 1978. So there's Raleigh as the young gunner, like 12, 13. Um, keep going, please. And Raleigh, uh, in that picture, again, he was about 14 years old. 
He's now 50, so 58, I believe. So Raleigh has spent the last 44 years out of his 58 years with the tree. So Raleigh literally grew up, grew the agency up and made us who we are today. He's one of many members that have like brought us along. So this is just Raleigh through the years. Came in back then, DDD was authoring, you know, youth group homes for our guys who were clearly like 10, 11, 12. And then earlier, there's Raleigh as a young teenager, early 20s, vacuuming the carpet. Keep going. We can just kind of slowly go along every few seconds or so. Housemates, clearly 1970s, 1980s house with the tag carpet and the lamps. There's Raleigh in his 30s working at the bowling alley um, in the work center when we had the workshops that Kelly was alluding to. Quick pause on here. Back in those times, the CBE and the center-based employment and the workshop and the piecework was very much the parlance of the day. That's what employment looked like for many of our people, most of them, in many of our agencies, statewide, nationwide, et cetera. All that is slowly changing, uh, and it's no diss to agencies that still have center-based employment. It's a huge thing, especially for the people like Raleigh who grew up in these programs. Um, and so there's some that still exist, but Raleigh in his heyday was you know, deep in the game as far as center-based, we can keep going. Uh, and then mix that with community and employment out in the community. And again, he lived in our homes and came to our day programs and all the rest. And then Raleigh eventually transitioned to an independent living arrangement. Okay, and we can pause right here, actually. An independent living arrangement um, where we were just sending staff in to make sure he was cool. But Raleigh essentially lived an independent life. And then when we all showed up, Kelly, myself, our current crew, 2017, 2018, 2019, we saw Raleigh's name a lot and we heard about him, but he had kind of retired. So he was living in his apartment. These were pictures of him in his apartment. We can keep going, uh, but he didn't come to program anymore. I had never even met him for the first two years, but you know, he was living retired life basically. So then pause right here, please. So then last year, all of a sudden we saw Raleigh and, and his staff was telling us, Oh man, you, I heard you guys doing special limits now. And Raleigh used to do that back in the day at a school and man, it's been so long. So we managed to convince Raleigh to come out last May to this, our 2023 state volleyball tournament. And when Raleigh showed up to Special Olympics, you could see him looking around going, whoa, I kind of remember this. He reconnected with Patty, one of his old staff from one of his own homes that he hadn't seen in 10 years. He met the fire slammer. You see him in the back. Keep going, please. And then Raleigh was so jazzed by that. Last summer we did Top Golf, Special Olympics Top Golf. So Raleigh made a, a triumphant return to the Opportunity Tree Campus, joining, rejoining Special Olympics, joining the Fire Slimer Nation, and then also joining our supported aging program, and then our arts program and our Scottsdale Art Studio partnerships was a whole other thing. And then before you knew it, Raleigh came back. Raleigh was back. So this is Raleigh now from 1978 to 2024. Keep going. Uh, and really just it kind of encapsulates a full, the full life cycle programming of this whole thing that we've been busy doing for 60 years. Now Raleigh, we see Raleigh every day, and he's doing it. And that's just kind of one story out of a trillion that we could sit here all day long and, and talk about. But it's what makes us proud to be part of the tree and to to just be doing this thing. So that is it, for real. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I love hearing stories like that. It it reminds us all that we we do make a difference and we do help people through through these kinds of programs. So it's always fun to to hear a personalized story like that. So I'm glad, I'm glad we were able to, to fit that in. Any questions for the amazing folks over at the Opportunity Tree? I don't have any questions, but I do want to say, Neil, my name is Miriam. I work with AmeriCorps Seniors and I would love to see uh, what ways we could partner um, in your organization and ours, because I think your mission and our mission basically coexists, our coexists, and I would love the opportunity to see how we could possibly assist with your program. Thank you so much. Just dropped it in the chat. I see your message too. Yes, please email us. We'll, we'd love to talk. We'd love to talk more. Thank you very much. That's fantastic. I can't see the email, so I my email is in the chat, but I will re-add it just in case. And then if you could just send me something, I'd greatly appreciate it. Gotcha. Yes, ma'am. Cool. You got it. Wonderful. All right, Mimi, I think we can go on to the next slide. All right, so new this year, um, we have the TAP recognition program for years of service and driver of the quarter. 
Um, so thank you to everyone who submitted nominations. I mean, we can go to the next slide. Uh, for years of service, um, our recognition goes to Cynthia, um, who's a transportation specialist from Hacienda Healthcare, um, who's been on the job in multiple roles for 22 years. And her colleagues describe her as the most pleasant, punctual, and detail-oriented person the world has to offer. That's lovely. Um, she's the type of person who will step up when needed, take on and complete any task um, that she's given with deep pride, and put care and safety of consumers first in any situation. Uh, she's a valuable asset um, to the agency and an all-around great person who deserves this recognition. So thank you, Cynthia, for all you do for the community. Is Cynthia on today? I don't see her. But if you have her email or anything, send her, send her a congratulations um, from all of us. Uh, next slide, please. And driver of the quarter um, is Joe, who's a driver with Northwest Valley Connect, um, who joined their team in 2023. Uh, his colleague say he follows all procedures and policies and fully embraces the culture at Northwest Valley Connect. Um, they get stories from writers at least once a month, telling them about something that Joe did to help them um, or how he went out of his way for them. Um, shortly after Joe started, he saw one of the writers. Um, he was going to pick up rolling herself backwards in an office chair on the sidewalk on a very busy street. Um, so he parked the bus, got out, and assisted her um, to get her back to her home safely. Um, NBC then notified her family of what happened, and they were extremely, extremely grateful um, for Joe's assistance that day. Uh, and that's just one example of how he truly cares for the writers um, that use that service. So thank you, Joe, for all that you do. I think we can go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so we recently had some agencies, um, new agencies come into the program and had questions about how to count trips. Um, and this is also a good reminder for, for all of us. So this agenda item is a little bit of a, a case study. Um, kind of reminds me of the, the story problems that we used to get on those standardized tests because there's lots of numbers and it's really a good, a good scenario and way to think about this. Um, so take some notes, grab a pen, some paper, um, and let's, let's go count some trips. All right, so we're starting the trip for the day from your agency. We have seven passengers, a driver, and two staff members who are leaving the agency on the bus. Next slide. The first stop is the library where one passenger works. Everyone gets out, goes, checks out their books, um, and loads up to go to the next stop, except for the one passenger who stays at the library to work. Next slide. The next stop is the grocery store, where one passenger and the driver stay on the bus. Everyone else um, gets off. Next stop is the post office. The stop is made so one of the staff members um, can drop off a package that they are mailing for someone's birthday. And now we're ending the day back at the agency with six passengers, the driver, and two staff members. Next slide. All right, so in summary, we'll go over this again. Seven passengers plus the driver and staff members leave the agency. First stop is the library where one passenger works. Everyone gets off the bus, uh, checks out their books, uh, loads back up on the bus, except for the one passenger that stays at the library. Next stop is the grocery store um, where one passenger and the driver stay behind on the vehicle. Everyone else gets off. And the next stop is at the post office so that the staff member can um, deliver or drop off that package. And then we return back to the agency. Next slide. 
how many trips were made? Go ahead and do your do your math and put your answer into the chat box. All right, we'll go ahead and give everyone a couple of minutes to do that. Can you put the other slide back up that was explaining it? Yes. Perfect. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mimi. Right, we've got three responses in the chat so far, so we'll give everybody a couple more minutes. Sorry, quick clarification question. This is the number of trips. Is it the trips that the vehicle takes or the trips per person, per passenger? We are counting the total trips for the day. So the trips i would assume that'd be per passenger okay got it Thank yep, you. so counting the passenger okay. trips that were on that vehicle for the day okay cool summary slide Miriam, I'm laughing at your your message in the chat that math is not your forte. Uh, so when Didi was going over this yesterday in our our kind of pre-meeting for the meeting, I was not following. I can't do math with story problems. <laughs> so I understand. All right, I'll give everyone one more minute. All right, I think we can go to the next slide, Mimi. All right, how many trips? 18. And we'll go over how how the math maths on that one. Next slide, Mimi. All right. So starting from the agency, there were seven passengers. When we count when we're counting trips, we don't count the driver or the agency staff. Next slide. The library stops. So we have six boardings. We don't count the driver. Um, or the two staff members, or of course the the person who does not get back on the bus. So we just count those six passengers who are getting back on the vehicle. Next slide. The grocery store stop is five boardings. So we don't count the driver and the passenger who stayed behind on the van. And again, we're not counting the staff members. So it's just the five people who got back onto um, the bus. Next slide. Post office, zero boardings um, because 
the person who got off and then back on um, was staff. And the stop was not incidental to that trip purpose. It was specifically for the staff member to um, stop and do something that they needed to do. Next. So that adds up to the 18 passenger trips um, for that day. And I'm sure there are going to be questions. So go ahead, ask, ask questions. Um, this is such a great example. Thank you guys so much because accurate counting of passenger boardings is so important, yet it is not always the easiest thing to do. But I like it that you called it boardings because that is the easiest way for me to remember is it's every time someone boards the vehicle. So it's regardless where you're going, drop-offs, pickups, all that, it's every time a client passenger, not a staff passenger, boards the vehicle. So great job. I love this. This great for people to understand it. So thank you. <laughs> I will definitely pass that along to Dee Dee. She's the one who put that together. And I thought it was really helpful to have the graphics um, with the passengers not kind of highlighted and the driver highlighted in one color and the, the staff members in another color. So it was easy to, to keep track. I'm glad that was helpful. Any other thoughts on the... The homework that we gave you today. All right, Mimi, I think we can go ahead to the next poll question. So we've got a couple more poll questions here. The first one is, is your agency at full staffing capacity for all of your programs? All right, 10% say yes, 85% say no, and 5% says never reduced capacity. So that will lead us into the next question. This is like a half of a poll question, I guess. Um, so the next one is, if you said no, have you at least seen an increase um, in your hiring recently? All right, 62% of you said yes, and 38% said no. So at least most of you have had an increase in hiring if you're not at full capacity. Um, so the next question for that is going to be, does your agency have enough drivers for the transportation trips that you provide to your consumers? And there is an answer option um, for if you do not provide transportation to consumers. All right, 56% of you said, yes, you do have enough drivers. And 
44% said no. And there's an answer in the chat box, so I'll go look at that. That makes sense, Billy, that you get the transportation done, but because of the short staffing, um, situations dictate extra driving. That That is something that I've heard, is that you're not fully staffed, you don't necessarily have enough drivers, but but you get but you get it done. All right, let's move on to the next <clears throat> next slide. So this leads us into um, Dee Dee and I will be attending the National Center for Mobility Management um, annual forum. Um, and they have a lot of information um, on this topic um, on their website um, and through a lot of their um, online learning portals. So we'll be attending all of the workshops that, that deal with that. Um, next slide, Mimi. And the um, Mobility Managers Forum is a part of the CTAA Expo. Um, and they will also have a lot of workshops there um, on hiring and retention, um, advertising for drivers, and a myriad of other things um, that are all centered around mobility management, public transit, um, and getting, getting these kind of programs up off the ground and continuing to run. So we'll be attending all of those workshops. We'll make sure to bring back any resources that we find um, to share with the group. And we're also presenting a workshop on how MAG uses the sub-regional mobility managers um, and how they are able to support the region, which I'm very excited about uh, because in my previous position, I was a mobility manager. So seeing how everyone runs things differently has always been one of my favorite things about mobility management. I had a, a mentor tell me that mobility management is like water. It fits where it needs to and how it needs to. So that leads me into probably one of the things I'm most excited about in this meeting is updates from our sub-regional mobility managers. So we've got Billy, Andrea, Justin, and Eric are our four sub-regional mobility managers, and they're going to provide a bit of an update. Do you want me to call on someone or who wants to volunteer to go first? I'll get mine out of the way first. <laughs> Sounds good. Hi, everybody. My name is Billy Parker. I'm a sub-regional mobility manager. Um, I'm also executive director for Chandler Gilbert Arc. We provide support services to adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We've been in business since 1975. Uh, we're located in the East Valley area, uh, mostly Chandler and Gilbert. Um, and uh, we provide uh, adult day services, community integrated employment, um, housing and community living, transportation, and uh, integrated volunteerism. Uh, we serve about um, 120 people, I think. It kind of varies. Um, and um, like I said, we've been in business since 1975. I've been a sub-regional mobility manager um, since I think this is my 10th year. And I've also been, our agency has, we've been 5310 recipients since I started with the organization in 1994. So uh, we've kind of seen a lot of the transition of, uh, you know, the, the, the many changes that uh, the 5310 process has gone through. And um, like I said, I've been a mobility manager for going on 10 years and have really seen a lot of positive changes that have come about um, as a result of um, having sub-regional mobility managers um, and being able to communicate so much so effectively with so many people around the valley about transportation issues. So um, I'm real happy to be to still be doing that and our organization to still be doing that. Um, in terms of some of the projects that I work on as a as a sub-regional mobility manager, um, 
one of my sort of main projects that I've worked on for years has been the whole vehicle loaning program um, that we do, uh, formerly known as vehicle sharing. Um, and uh, it's a process whereby um, we are able to actually loan vehicles to other uh, nonprofit organizations. And uh, there's a whole process for doing that and developing the partnership and, and managing the insurance and different things awesome. like that. And um, it's been a really successful program for us. We've had um, a couple different partners uh, in doing that. And we're always happy to, to look for and to take on new partners for anybody that might need access to one of our vehicles um, at any given time. So, um, so in that light, I continue to do trainings on vehicle loaning and, and continue to sort of update our processes in order to meet new regulations and, um, and to sort of reflect the needs of the community. So um, that's one of the big things that I do. Also, I kind of look uh, a little more broadly also at just at collaboration, not just from vehicle sharing, but our or vehicle loaning, uh, but also uh, we've talked about uh, creating sharing vehicles through sort of a brokerage model and also um, looking at other ways of partnering with other organizations to also even eventually maybe share a vehicle or apply together for one vehicle to be used by two organizations. So that's a lot of the kind of things that I still talk about with other organizations and we still look at it. I also look at vehicle disposals at um, uh, and have spent a lot of time working with Wendy. Thank you, Wendy, um, for all your work on that. And, and we're working together to really sort of simplify and sort of create the vehicle disposal process to make it a little bit more user friendly for uh, organizations, and we've really made a lot of headway. I know that uh, there's been at least at least two changes to the process with the city of Phoenix so far, and we're looking at eventually maybe trying to come up with one process that supports both the city of Phoenix mag vehicles and also a dot vehicles. So uh, there's a lot to do still on that, but it's we're making some great progress. So. Um, I also do some uh, different trainings. I do one called It's a Moving Target, and I do another one called Let Me Out of This Box. And It's a Moving Target really um, started during COVID, and it was really just about uh, strategies for organizations to uh, work together um, and just manage everyday issues, um, transportation included. And so um, obviously, as you can imagine, when, for, when COVID first came on, um, it was really all about, are you even still in business? How are you staying in business? How are you providing transportation? How are you providing safety? Um, how are you dealing with people with infections? How are you dealing with vaccines? You know, like all of that kind of stuff. And it, it's really, uh, my trainings are really more of an open forum um, as much as possible. So, um, and as that's moved on and, you know, COVID is not what it once was. Um, we are, it's also expanded to looking at things like personnel and recruitment, um, you know, sort of targeting for, to find employees, um, vehicle disposals, also pronouns in the workforce and um, in professional uh, circumstances and how that all sort of fits into the kind of work we do and self-determination. Um, and uh, the other training that I do, uh, let me out of this box, it's mostly revolves around vehicle sharing, vehicle loaning, the brokerage model, and also uh, disposals. And so um, typically what happens with my trainings is a few weeks before it's time to do the training, I kind of look at some of the projects that I've been working on or been communicating on with other organizations and sort of modify the training to fit that. So when people come to the training, they're not seeing the same thing. So uh, moving forward, continuing with those processes. Um, I also, because of the amount of time that I've spent um, doing grant proposals and the successes our organization has had, um, I also do trainings in um, how to do 5310 proposals and different challenges people might have. And different strategies for having a successful proposal. So I work on that um, 
continuing to work on the disposal process and also have been looking at a, another project moving forward to really kind of develop some more materials about mobility management that us as organizations can use. I know our company brochure, for example, says we do mobility management, but it says it along with a bunch of other things that we do versus maybe a dedicated brochure for mobility management. So I'm gonna be talking with um, other members of our team with that and uh, looking at that moving forward. So uh, I think that's about it for me, unless anybody has any questions. Thanks, I will go Billy. Next, if that's okay. Of course, Andrea, go ahead. Um, I always wait until last because I am the the newest uh, mobility manager, but I have a situation going on at one of my programs that I have to get to. So, um, uh, I don't have a lot right now. Um, like I said, I just I go to Billy and Justin and Eric for a lot of advice. I've been only doing mobility management for about a year. I'm still learning about 5310 and, and ride sharing and a lot about the grant. And we actually just have a brand new transportation director. So um, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning about the transportation and, and MAG and the grant and what we do and what we can offer everyone. And so I'm just kind of uh, learning from, from the best pros right now. I'm glad that you're able to reach out to everyone and get, get advice on stuff. And please reach out to me if I can be helpful in any way as well. You bet I will. I'm learning our um, data system and have tons of questions. Justin has been helping, so I couldn't do what I do without them. Good. I'm glad that, that y'all are working together on that. That's wonderful. Thank you. You're welcome. I'll go next. Wonderful. Thanks, Justin. Sure. So Justin McGregor, uh, been a sub-regional ability manager now for five years. Uh, we currently cover the West Valley. I conduct uh, driver safety training as well as um, the uh, fleet main maintenance training uh, for the 5310 program. I also uh, assist uh, multiple agencies out there so far with developing their operational manual for their driving program as well as their fleet maintenance program. So if anyone ever you know, gets a situation where they need help on these topics, uh, please feel free to re reach out to me. I'll be more than happy to help. Wonderful. Thanks, Justin. It's always helpful to have someone who's, who's good at writing all of those maintenance program procedures and everything. That's, that's a, that's a tough job. And last but certainly certainly not least, Eric, do you want to go ahead and give an update? You can hear us, Eric, you're muted. So it looks like Eric is here, but I'm not sure if he can hear us.
All righty, well, I'll move on. And if Eric jumps in and wants to give an update, um, we can do that. All right, I want to thank all of our speakers and our mobility managers for giving their updates today and letting us know what's all going on. I am very, very excited to be a part of MAG and to learn from all of you and to work with all of you uh, on all of your projects. If you need anything, please reach out and let me know. I will be reaching out to, I'm sure, all of you very, very shortly um, to, to kind of jump on in and, and see what I can do to help you all with everything. So with that, I will give you back a little bit of your day and thanks thanks for being here and thanks for, for all of the wonderful information. Super great job on your first meeting, Lauren. Very nice. Thank you. For sure, Lauren, thank you. Great job, thank you. Yes, thank you.